With Redshift now being part of Cinema, we finally have a modern renderer right at our fingertips. The first time you dive into Redshift, the whole experience can feel quite intimidating. There are so many new concepts and a gazillion commands and options to wrap your head around. But I think one of the scariest features that will give new users a whole lot of headache has to be Redshift's AOVs. The plan with this video is to reduce the learning curve of AOVs just a tiny bit, enough for you to see what's possible so you can start exploring things on your own. AOVs can be incredibly powerful, so you shouldn't be missing out on one of the most flexible and powerful features in your toolbox. So take a deep breath and let's go. AOV is just a fancy way of saying multi-pass rendering. With passes, we can make big changes to an image without having to re-render. We can change colors, the strength of reflections, depth of field, we can even change the lighting of our image. So knowing how to set up these passes can be a huge time saver. If we open up Redshift's AOV manager, the list is quite long. Do we need all these when we render out an image? No. Definitely not, we usually only need a tiny fraction of those. The bad news is that the type of passes you will need depends on the image, so there's no hard and fast rule here. Why is that you might ask? Let me show you why. In this image we have an object that relies heavily on reflections and refractions, so apart from a diffuse or a GI pass, we also need to add those. This image, on the other hand, has none of these requirements. It's a very diffuse object, so it doesn't need the reflection or refraction pass. And we haven't even touched on other elements like caustics or luminous objects. It really depends on the type of scene we're working on, so the number and the type of passes will always vary. The good thing is that it's relatively easy to figure out the ones we need because we can preview all of them right inside Redshift's render window. So, Let's work on this scene's passes. Nowadays, people use OpenEXR as the format of choice, especially when it comes to multi-pass images. But since Photoshop doesn't play that well with OpenEXR, I'll go with PSD. For maximum color accuracy and editability, we can go all the way up to 32 bits, but I find 16 bits good enough for my needs, so I'll just stick to that. Now, on to the nitty gritty. I always start with the beauty pass because I want to have a point of reference. I never use it in the final composite, it's just there to make sure the AOVs are converging to the correct result. And in case you're not aware, the beauty pass is basically the complete render in one single image. Lights, shadows, depth of field, it's all there. Now, what are the passes we're going to need? We can build our image in different ways, it really depends on how much we want to adjust in post. So we could go super granular if we wanted to, but for now let's start simple. Let's start with the diffuse pass. As you can see we have different choices here. The one we need for now is the diffuse lighting pass. Let's preview that to see how it looks. As you can see this one has the diffuse and the lighting part merged. If we wanted to separate the two, we would have to use some other passes. The diffuse filter for the diffuse part, and the diffuse lighting raw for the shading part of the render. The reason the bottle is not showing up at all is because all the bottle parts are behind transparent surfaces. The cap and the actual bottle. So if I quickly delete these two, you'll see that now all the bottle parts show up. Okay. So far so good. Let's get rid of these two, just to keep things simple, and let's see what else we need. For sure we want the reflections, so let's add that. Again we have different options and our choice depends on how we want to blend things. But since we're keeping it simple, we're gonna choose the reflection pass. And just to make sure we have the right one, let's preview the pass in the render view. Yep, that looks correct. We now need the specular and the refraction pass, so let's add those and check our render once more. As you can see, the bulk of the bottle is in the refraction pass, because it's hiding behind all the transparent surfaces. Finally, the last pass needed is the GI pass, so let's add that, and like before, let's preview it in the render view. And that's it! 
We can now hit render and once it's ready, we can check things in Photoshop. The image looks different than the render in the picture viewer because all layers are enabled and in additive mode. If you recall, we don't really need the beauty pass, so if we disable that, the image now looks correct. And just to double check that the pass has converged to the beauty pass, here's the beauty pass alone, and here's how all the passes look together. Perfect. Now that our image is in layers, we can adjust things however we want. We can change the intensity of the speculars, we can adjust the reflections, we basically can fine tune the image without having to re-render. And that's really powerful, especially if you're running against the clock. The one element that cannot be adjusted that easily is the shadows. We currently don't have any passes targeting that area. There are two ways to go about this. We could either build our image with different passes like the diffuse filter and the diffuse lighting raw I showed you earlier, but the easiest way is to just add one more pass to the mix, and that's the shadow pass. So let's find it in the manager and add it to the list. If we preview this, you'll see that the shadows look weird. Instead of black, we're getting white. But think of this pass as a mask instead of a layer used in an additive mode like all the other passes. So let's re-render and go back to Photoshop. As expected, the image looks weird with the shadows layer enabled. So let's fix that. Let's uh, bring up a levels layer. And now we're going to copy the shadows layer and paste it onto the mask of the levels adjustment layer. So what we're essentially telling the adjustment layer to do is to target this specific part of the image. So now we can brighten up the shadows, we can darken them, whatever adjustment we do is restricted to the masked area. So when we're building an image, here's what we have to have at the back of our heads. If we know that we won't have to do a ton of changes in post, we can go with simple passes or we can just render a single image. But if we know that there will be a ton of adjustments, we should always pick the passes that will give us the biggest flexibility. Let me show you what I mean. This scene uses a strong light, casting some heavy shadows. But we're not really set on the final look. If we use only a couple of passes, like the combined uh, diffuse and lighting pass and a specular pass, we can't really do much to adjust the lighting. We might be able to bring out some details uh, from the shadows, but other than that, we're kind of stuck with what we have. Now, if we separate the diffuse and lighting pass into two, we will instantly have a ton more flexibility. This simple adjustment alone will make a world of difference. We now can easily dial up or down the shadows. One thing to keep in mind here is that the raw type of channels are not used in additive mode, but in multiply. So when you load up the file in Photoshop or any other compositing package, you need to make that switch. Now if we add a couple more passes into the mix, like the shadow pass and the GI pass, we can make even bigger adjustments. This image is just using masks to brighten or darken parts of the image. And as you can see, we can go quite far with these basic adjustments. This is what we started with, and this is what we ended up with. That is quite a difference. I think by now you have a feeling about how to navigate multipasses in Redshift. It's nothing really that difficult. There will be a bit of trial and error, and you might get frustrated as you're trying to figure things out, but after some time it will become second nature. And to save you on a bit of frustration, here's a couple more tips. Most of Redshift's AOVs work in preview mode without any issues, but there are some exceptions. So if a pass renders black and you feel you should be seeing something, make sure to check bucket rendering. Here for example, even though we have the object ID pass enabled and our objects do have the Redshift tag and the object ID properly set up, we don't see anything at all. But once we enable bucket rendering, here it is. The same applies to puzzle mats. We use those to easily mask objects or parts of an object. It makes for easy selection and post. So here I've enabled the puzzle mat pass and I'm using the object ID as the way to color the different parts of the chair. The objects that have object ID 1 will be colored red, the ones with object ID 2 will be colored green, and the ones with ID 3 will have a color blue. 
So far so good. Everything looks correctly set up, but once again, when we switch to the puzzle mat pass, nothing shows up. Once we enable bucket rendering, the puzzle mat is right there. Another thing that might drive you insane is finding the material ID. This one is just a poor UI decision and I hope it will be fixed in a future update because it's just unnecessarily hidden. There will be times where you will want to mask objects based on their materials. That's why in our puzzle mat we can choose between object ID and material ID. So where can we set up this material ID? If we click on the material, it's nowhere to be found. The only way to access it is by going into the node editor <laughs> and then clicking on the output node. Yeah, it's the most hidden parameter ever. Last but not least, make sure that transparency is not messing things up. Here for example we have a puzzle mat on all objects inside the bottle, but because most of the pieces are covered by another surface, the mats don't show up at all. The only thing we have to do here is to enable this reflect refract IDs option. And now our mats show up as expected. And I think that's about it. It might take you some time to wrap your head around AOVs, but don't feel discouraged. The whole compositing and multipass workflow can get quite complicated, and the interface is not doing us any favors. But keep at it, and at some point things will click. At least I hope that this video was a good enough trigger for you to want to try things out. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.